If I stood out in the rain in the night, my only light a candle a million miles away, would you lay down your fire as I raised mine? Would you not kill again? You gotta mute the YouTube, Amar. <laughs> and oh, when you're near me, oh my love, oh my joy, there's nothing ever to weary me, oh my darling one. Good morning, welcome to Community Church of Boston. Uh, I, I open as I have for the last month or so or, uh, with the words of Cindy Callett, uh, her song Rain Night. You can find it online if you want to hear the whole song. It's a beautiful uh, image of the candle of the still small voice uh, crying in the night for, for justice, for sensibility. Happy Chinese New Year to all of you. And I want to start by recognizing two wonderful Chinese people in my life. The first I was just on the phone with, his name is Jinli Zhu. Uh, he lives in, in California and he is our uh, accountant and bookkeeper. And he has just been with us for a long time and just does such wonderful, meticulous, beautiful, brilliant work keeping, uh, keeping our books and keeping us transparent and honest. Jin Li Zhu is the first one. The second one is an 11-year-old boy named Kingsley Chen who uh, gave us a, a full concert of classical music. He's a child prodigy genius, not only technically flawless, but also puts incredible heart and soul, just really the, 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 the real thing. Then he came back um, to play in one of our Sundays, and uh, we found out that his parents dropped him off, and they went, went back out because they deliver Amazon packages. Uh, it's not like he comes from like big privilege or anything. It's just like this, uh, this amazing thing that's just out of nowhere. And he, Kingsley, I'll also mention, has become a Mars chess buddy. Um, they, they're playing chess. It's, it's a, a cool thing. After his classes at, at New England Conservatory. I love that. So happy Chinese New Year. Um, I'm going to be uh, very brief in, in remarks because we have just such a wonderful program today. And it starts out with uh, one of my favorite Boston uh, songwriting voices. Um, he's been here a couple of times uh, uh, recently and a long time ago. I think uh, um, Jim came to hear Barry Crimmins. Uh, uh, perform here. And then recent, more recently, he was at, at Jeff Bartley open mic night. And um, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, I just love his voice with, with what it's, it's just so profound and so comedic and so in your face uh, all at the same time. Um, uh, I even invited him, Jim, sing whatever you want. You can even sing the song that's called Asshole. <laughs> Only at Community Church of Boston, or the ones that's that's come that's called um, uh, Depravity. Oh boy, that is an incredible song. Anyway, I have no idea what Jim's going to sing, but I know it's going to be really good. So I want you all across the planet to welcome to our humble stage, Jim Infantino. Thank you, Dean. Thank you. Uh, that's a great idea. This is a good song for a church, uh, especially a church inside of the. Um, Puritanical belt of uh, Boston and New England. No. Human beings like kissing other human beings. Depravity is all around us. To, oh, so the chorus is, and it comes around a lot. Depravity is all around us. And then at some point I sing, Depravity, depravity. Lord, save us all from depravity. Very appropriate for, for this, uh, this area, I think. Human beings like kissing other human beings. Depravity is all around us. To lick and to bite other pretty human beings. Lord, save us all from depravity. And human beings like feeling busy all the time. Depravity. Is all around us. So they smoke weeds and flowers. 
beers and they drink beer and wine. Depravity, depravity, Lord save us all from depravity. I just want to feel good. I just want to feel good. Boys and girls who like girls Depravity is all around us Would they switch sides if you offered them the world? Lord, save us all from depravity And some human beings like to get naked for you Depravity is all around us Others prefer a more remote point of view Depravity Depravity, Lord, save us all from depravity. But I just want to feel good. I just want to feel good like bending others to their needs. Depravity is all around us. Some will use whips, some will use beads. Lord, save us all from depravity. Thank goodness for the pious who tell us how to behave. Depravity is all around us. With whom we should war, who we should enslave. Depravity Profanity, insanity, humanity, Lord save us all from insanity, Lord save us all from humanity, Lord save us all from depravity. In nomine patri. Jim Infantino, thank you, thank you so much. Um, you can hear uh, Jim's amazing band uh, online, they're all over the place. Uh, they're called Jim's Big Ego. And I would, I would recommend one more song which, uh, from, from them, which is called I'm Addicted to Stress, which is uh, a classic, and it talks a lot about my favorite libation, which is coffee. And um, so uh, check out Jim. We'll hear more from him a little bit later. Um, I will tell you that our new newsletter is, is out. Thank you, Crystal Rollins Jackson, for putting it together. And we have amazing programs. Uh, next week, it's going to be a, a sort of an inward look at ourselves and our 104 year history. This is called an archive dive. We'll be going up to the fifth floor of our, our commercial building here in Copley Square and looking at uh, some of our historical records, which are sort of in a shambles, but uh, we're really finally taking them out of the closet and giving them their, their due and hoping that we can make them more accessible and more available and celebrate our history. So several of us will be going up there and, and doing that during the next week and talking about what we find. You know, it might be something like, um, uh, well, I was just up there for a half an hour with Jerry Kaplan and, and I found the, the original transcript of 
Herbert Philbrick, when he spoke to the House on American Activities about Com Community Church of Boston being a, a haven for communists, um, that sort of thing that you just kind of, f f I, I, I've been up there probably more than anybody else, and I, every time I'm up there, there's something really interesting and really new and unusual. So please, if you're interested in, in joining in on, on next week's conversation, uh, send me an email, dean at deanstevens.com. We also have the W.B. Du Bois uh, address on February 25th. Du Bois spoke here uh, a, a whole bunch of times during the 30s, 40s, and uh, final, final uh, address here was 1959. We have a recording of it on our YouTube channel. You can find it there. Um, <clears throat> We have a uh, March a program about uh, yoga for personal and collective change. We have Eva Mosley, who's talking about uh, her memoir. It's called uh, Skirting History, Holocaust Refugee to Dissenting Citizen. We have Mazen Kumsia, who joins us from Bethlehem in the West Bank. And his, his address is called Live from Bethlehem, a Bedouin in Cyberspace, a Villager at Home. Um, we also have Professor Gerald Horn, who joins us from Texas, and um, his, his address is called On the Genocide of Gaza and U.S. Foreign Policy. Um, and f finally, on this, on this program is Audrey Shulman, who is the director of the, the organization HEAT, which has done remarkable uh, work here in the city of Boston on, on greening up this city and, and doing amazing work with with what's called microgrids, getting getting like just a street, um, all geothermal, uh, collectively geothermal. It's it's kind of a, a Marxist idea, but it, it's it's gaining a lot of purchase, and a lot of um, utilities are getting behind it. All kinds of great stuff, and I won't forget to uh, mention a couple of a uh, couple of concerts coming up. Um, March 29th, David Rovix will be here, people's troubadour and uh, magnificent um, poet and, and uh, commentator on the scene um, and political songwriter. April 6th, we have Joni Mitchell Knight, which will be brought to us by students and alumni of Berklee College of Music, and it will be a benefit for Doctors Without Borders uh, Gaza Relief. Um, Later in May, we have this guy named Dean Stevens, who will be turning 70 in that month and uh, doing a concert with some of his friends. Uh, May 24th is the exact date. So that's a few things going on. Um, February, 19th, August, February 19th, thank you. Amar Ahmad, who is our Zoomster uh, in the back and new member of our team at Community Church. Uh, not new, most recent, let's say. Um, uh, February 19th is coming right up, and it is Dr. <laughs> she will be introduced by Martin Sheen, but it, it, come on, Dr. Helen Caldicott, thank you. Brain fart, brain fart. Um, Dr. Helen Caldicott will be, will be with us, uh, um, and uh, that's on a... Wednesday night, if I'm not mistaken, and it's the, the monthly address that's brought to us by the John F. Kennedy Speech Committee that celebrates Kennedy's speech at American University on uh, June 10th, 1963. Um, and every, every, time, every time we do this address, we listen to that speech, which is just remarkable in its historic nature. Um, two packages came in the mail. One is a package uh, of beautiful T-shirts. This, um, I don't know if you can see it out there, but it's, it's the design of uh, Shukri Abu Bakr, who is one of the Holy Land Foundation Five, who is serving 65 years for loving the children of Gaza and West Bank and wanting the best for them. Um, uh, the long story, the short version of the story is that they ran a charity that ran afoul of 9-11 mentality and, and they were shut down and arrested and are now three of them still 
serving 65 years. This is his artwork. We have also his beads that he makes out of bread. Beads, bread beads, and makes uh, beautiful, paints them, and prayer, prayer beads, they're called masbaha, Muslim prayer beads. Um, lots of other things for sale in this auditorium. Um, the other package that came was, uh, I'll, I'll sing myself for a moment. Uh, this has been out of print for about five years, and now it's back in print. It's a record that I did um, 30 years ago, and proceeded to forget about it because it was the moment that I became obsessed with this country called El Salvador and began traveling there frequently and taking groups and uh, developing long-term deep friendships with some villages there. Um, so those two packages arrived. And um, I want to be as brief as I can. I've always already been too long-winded um, because we have just a remarkable New addition to our roster of speakers, um, uh, Trita Parsi w is, is joining us today. Thank you, Trita, for, uh, for gracing us with your presence from all the way across the, the continent. Um, Trita Parsi uh, is an award-winning author and the 2010 recipient of the Grauemeyer, did I say that right, Award for Ideas Improving World Order. He is the Executive Vice President of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft and an expert on U.S.-Iranian relations, Iranian foreign policy, and the geopolitics of the Middle East. He was named by the Washington, Washingtonian Magazine as one of the 25 most influential voices on foreign policy in Washington, D.C. in both 2021 and 2022, and preeminent public intellectual Noam Chomsky calls Parsi, quote, one of the most distinguished scholars on Iran, unquote. It's, it's really a, an, an honor to have you here, Trita, and thank you for joining us this morning. We look forward to hearing you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's a great pleasure to be with you all at the Community Church of Boston uh, on this very, very important topic. I'm uh, tremendously grateful for what all of you have done for us to be able to bring this horrible war to an end, uh, and not just this episode of the war, but the, the conflict overall as well as the tensions in the region uh, overall and deeply appreciate of everything you all have done and grateful for having me uh, speak to you all today we are now more than 110 115 days into this horrible chapter of this long conflict and before we go into uh, some of the causes etc i just want to remind everyone about what we're talking about in terms of the human suffering that has taken place. We are now at a stage in which more than 28,000 confirmed deaths have taken place in Gaza. That does not count. Thousands of people that are probably still under the rubble and have not been able to be identified. These are numbers from the Gaza Health Ministry or, or agency which incidentally, despite the fact that Biden earlier on in the conflict dismissed, it is the very same agency that the Israelis themselves rely on to make assessments of the number of deaths in Gaza, as well as the agency that the US State Department relies on to make that assessment. So one that is seen as tremendously credible, and at this point, I don't think anyone is questioning any longer their authority. Out of these, we're talking about roughly more than 12,000 children that have been killed. And this is important to understand because this conflict is deadlier at a faster pace than any of the conflicts that we have seen in recent history. Just a point of comparison, over the course of more than two years of warfare in Ukraine, there's been roughly 700 children that have been killed there, which is of course horrific. But the response that generated from the West is of a completely different proportion than the absence of a response that we've seen from the West when we're talking about more than 12,000 children killed in Gaza over the course of roughly four months, not two years. Moreover, the pace of the killing is such that it is a magnitude of roughly 10 times that of what we saw in Iraq, in Afghanistan, 
in Libya, as well as the civil war in Syria. So even though it's been uh, a shorter period of time, the intensity uh, of the killings, roughly 200 to 250 per day, is of a completely different magnitude that we've seen in some of these other uh, conflicts, which is partly why the reaction around the world has been so strong and so adamant towards ending this conflict. Unfortunately, that is not the reaction of the US government. And we have seen um, speculation that the reason why Biden has not come out in favor of a ceasefire at one point saying it would be impossible um, is because he's trying to achieve it through other means, through uh, beer hugging the Israelis, etc., etc. I think at this point, we have to be quite clear that the reason why there hasn't been a ceasefire of, or a prolonged ceasefire is not because Biden has tried and failed, but because Biden not only has not tried, Biden has been in support of the policy and the conduct of this war as perpetrated by the Israeli government. He has shipped more than 10,000 tons of weapons to Israel since October 7th. Twice has he circumvented congressional overview in order to get the weapons to Israel faster. He has rejected measures to um, uh, bind these weapon shipments to any type of a criteria or demands by the United States. Twice has he vetoed resolutions at the UN Security Council calling for a humanitarian pause. They didn't even go as far as to call for a ceasefire. On a third instance, he successfully watered down the resolution not to call for even a humanitarian pause or a ceasefire and still did not vote in favor of it. This has all brought the United States to a point of international isolation that we have not seen since the war in Iraq. In the General Assembly, the United States has been as isolated on the issue of a ceasefire in Gaza as Russia has been on its illegal invasion of Ukraine. That is a remarkable decline in American standing in a very, very short period of time, which could not have been achieved had it not been for these excessive measures in support of the manner that Israel has conducted this war. I think it's also important to keep in mind how the region and the rest of the world sees this, mindful of the fact that President Biden attended the war cabinet in Israel immediately after the Hamas attacks on October 7th. Whether true or not, the impression that has left the people of the region is such that the United States is not just in support of the war, the United States approved the war and the manner in which it has been conducted. This makes the anger of the region and much of the world, not just directed at Israel, but also at the United States. And the question that I think has to come to mind then is, what is it in the interest of the United States that makes the continued warfare of Israel in Gaza so important that the president is willing to accept such tremendous risk, the isolation of the United States internationally, but also the risk of escalation in the region on four different fronts, and I'll go into that more deeply in a second. And on top of that, according to the president himself and the Democratic Party itself, they insist that the current elections this year in November is not just about who will be president, it is about the survival of American democracy, arguing that Trump is a threat to American democracy, an argument that I think many easily could agree to. But then the question is, if American democracy is at stake, and granted, the manner in which Trump has, sorry, Biden has uh, hurt himself 
with the electorate because of his support for Israel's war in Gaza. And this is not just in the Arab American community. This is particularly amongst the young people of the United States that are not on board with anything that resembles a genocide, as well as increasingly with the African American community. These are three of the most important pillars of Biden's winning coalition in 2020, and they are crumbling. Poll after poll after poll shows that they are crumbling. So if American democracy is at stake and his policy is crumbling his ability to get reelected, then I think it's fair to say that Biden is not just jeopardizing his own reelection, the policy he's pursuing and refuses to shift from uh, in Israel and Gaza is also jeopardizing American democracy, according to Biden's own statements in terms of defining the elect this election to be about uh, American democracy. I want to speak a little bit about the four different fronts in which there is also the risk of further escalation in the region. And this is, I think, a very critical element because it's not just that Biden signed on to and supported the manner in which Israel has conducted this war. It's that from the very outset, Biden knew that this would risk regional escalation. It was a critical objective of the administration, rightly so, to prevent a regional escalation that could drag the United States into that war. Yet the strategy that has been pursued has been one in which uh, Biden's primary focus has been to allow the Israelis maximum maneuverability to do what they want, while then hoping that this will not lead to regional escalation. There's four different fronts in which the continued fighting in Gaza or the continued slaughter in Gaza risk fueling uh, a regional conflict. On the one hand, you have the Israeli-Lebanese border in which immediately after Israel's invasion into Gaza, uh, tensions rose between Hezbollah and Lebanon. There's been an exchange of fire extensively, um, uh, quite a few casualties on both sides, but nothing that yet has reached the level of an actual war. According to a recent Israeli report, war between Israel and Hezbollah would become the deadliest war in Israel's entire history. A barrage of roughly 2,500 to 3,000 uh, missiles would hit Israel throughout its entire territory uh, every day for more than three weeks. This is a level and an intensity that makes it very difficult for the Iron Dome to provide the protection that Israel usually is benefiting from when we're talking about a dozen or so missile or projectiles fired in to Israel from Gaza. This would lead scores uh, dead on both sides and unprecedented destruction in both countries. From the US standpoint also, this would dramatically increase the likelihood that the US would be dragged into that war because of the tremendous military difficulties Israel would face in such a confrontation. According to the Biden administration itself, it does not believe that Hezbollah wants this confrontation, but it does believe that Netanyahu and the Israelis have been looking for this confrontation. Part of the reason for that is that uh, uh, an argument that became very prevalent after Hamas's attack on Israel on October 7th was that Israel thought that it could manage Hamas, it could go in every two years, bomb a little bit, every two years there would be a few Israeli casualties, but it would be a death rate that Israel could manage, and as a result, this so-called mowing the lawn strategy was uh, uh, an adequate one for the Israelis to pursue, set aside international law, uh, morality, etc. But after the October 7th attacks on Israel and more than 1,200 deaths, this completely changed the mindset in Israel. This is not a death rate the Israelis in any way, shape or form could find acceptable. And the question that rose then was, if we thought we could manage Hamas, and it turned out that 1,200 Israelis died, 
We have also thought that we can have a degree of deterrence with Hezbollah, but what if they were to try to do the same type of attack on Israel as Hamas did? Mindful of the fact that Hezbollah is much more powerful than Hamas, this could lead to a far greater degree of death on the Israeli side. This is part of the reason then as a result that the Israelis have come to a conclusion of thinking that living next to Le uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon is intolerable. This is part of the reason why settlers have not returned to their uh, settlements in the north. We're talking about roughly 75,000 people. Uh, and why the Israelis have essentially reached a conclusion that because it's intolerable, they have to attack Hezbollah at some point during this war um, in order to make sure that they remove from their perspective that threat. So just to recap, the US intelligence itself has assessed that the Israelis have an interest and a desire to expand the war. Hezbollah does not. Yet the US strategy has been to put pressure on Hezbollah, not on Israel. And this goes back to the broader picture of how the Biden administration um, has really not used any of the leverage it does have in order to pressure the Israelis. So this is the first front. At this point, it appears that he has at least temporarily calmed down, but we're not in any way, shape or form out of the woods when it comes to that confrontation. The second one is what is happening in the Red Sea, in which the Houthi movement in Yemen after Israel's invasion of Gaza, started targeting ships that were either Israelis, owned by Israelis, or in their assessment were heading towards Israel uh, as a way of imposing a cost on Israel to pressure it to seize its bombardment of Gaza. After several weeks of having done this, the United States, together with the United Kingdom, decided to take military action against the Houthis, we have now seen numerous attacks and bombing campaigns by the UK and the United States against the Houthis, whereas we have not seen an end to the Houthi attacks on those ships. According to Biden itself, himself, the strategy is not working, yet we are not only continuing it, we are intensifying it. What is so odd in the approach here is that it is absolutely clear despite public statements by the British government uh, or and as well as by some American officials trying to disconnect connect what the Houthis are doing from what is happening uh, in Gaza. Uh, it is absolutely clear that this is a response to Gaza and as a result, had there been a push for a ceasefire, it could have been a much more effective way of ending those attacks on those ships than by escalating in the manner that the Biden administration has done by starting to bomb Yemen again. And, and we should remember the Saudis, with the help of the United States, bombed the Houthis for more than eight years, got nowhere. The Houthis are more powerful today than they were eight years ago. Uh, so the track record here is not particularly good. Moreover, tensions and risks for traveling through the Red Sea has actually increased as a result of the American bombardment of Yemen, because now it's a two-way shooting uh, uh, war in the Red Sea, which makes most commercial companies thinking that it's simply better to avoid the Red Sea altogether, which ironically then makes the Houthi attempt of essentially blockading the Red Sea more effective than it was before. The third front is Iraqi and Syrian militias close to Iran, who have been attacking U.S. bases and troops, particularly after October 17th, when Israel went into Gaza, and the risk of that leading to a larger escalation. And we saw roughly two weeks ago that unfortunately they succeeded. Uh, a drone, uh, a suicide drone, managed to get its way into uh, a, a U.S. base on the Syrian-Jordanian border, leaving three American soldiers killed. This then led to an escalation by the US with uh, a large bombing campaign as well as assassination campaign against Iraqi and Syrian militias, uh, as well as deep inside of Iraq itself. There was one just a couple of days ago in Baghdad uh, in a residential area that killed a senior member of one of those militias. Again, very important to remember here. 
that these attacks by these militias started as a result of Israel's bombardment of Gaza. Just to give you a bit of an idea of how these things have looked. Between January 2021, when Biden came into office, and March 2023, there were roughly 80 attacks by Syrian or Iraqi militias against U.S. troops or U.S. bases. So 80 attacks over the course of roughly two years. Then there was a pause over the summer because of a, a truce that was found between the United States and Iran and the Iranians pressured these groups to cease their attacks. After October 17th, not only did they restart, but they were dramatically intensified. Over the course of these uh, roughly three and a half, four months, we have now seen more than 170 attacks by these militias against U.S. troops and targets. 170 plus attacks compared to 80 over the course of two years, 170 over the course of four months, all directly related to the war in Gaza. Explicit statements by the Iraqi militias as well as the Houthis that they will stop if Israel stops. And since the U.S. was not putting pressure on Israel, these militias calculated apparently that they would put pressure on the United States to put pressure on Israel by intensifying their attacks. Now, one could perhaps make the argument that Biden's strategy by and large has been successful because it has not led to a major escalation and it, it's only three Americans that were killed uh, uh, two weeks ago. That, however, I think is a very optimistic take on what actually has happened. There's been numerous attempts, some of them quite successful, but only out of pure luck. They did not leave Americans killed. On October 26th, only about nine days after Israel went into Gaza, there was an attack by another suicide drone uh, in the city of Erbil at an air base there that you, houses U.S. soldiers in northern Iraq. The drone managed to get through the American air defenses and it even hit the barracks where American soldiers were sleeping at 5 a.m. in the morning. It hit it on the second floor. Out of pure luck, the drone malfunctioned and the explosives did not explode. And as a result, there were no American deaths. Had it exploded, we're talking about potentially dozens of American deaths. So Biden throughout all of this has known that every day he may get a report saying that American soldiers in the region have been killed as a result of the U.S.'s support for Israel's war in Gaza. And he has chosen to accept that risk and essentially gamble that it wouldn't happen, that we would be safe, and that it wouldn't lead to a major escalation. And yet 10 days ago, finally, unfortunately, it did happen. And now we are directly bombing three different countries in the region on almost a weekly basis. And this as an effort to avoid an escalation. So the strategy has been to give the Israelis maximum maneuverability to do what they want to do in Gaza while adopting, accepting major risk to the U.S. itself, and of course the risk that the U.S. would end up getting dragged into this war as a way of allowing the Israelis to continue to do what they're doing. Now, one could perhaps make the argument that if there was any chance that the Israelis could succeed in taking out the Hamas leadership, that perhaps there was some form of a uh, geostrategic justification for the risks that Biden has accepted. Mm -hmm. But it is utterly clear that the Israelis have not only failed, but also that there was no chance that they could have succeeded to begin with. And don't take it from me, take it from the pr previous Israeli Prime Minister, Ehud Olmert, who about a month into this conflict wrote an op-ed in the Haaretz, in Israel, in Hebrew, and the first line of his op-ed was that the prospect of completely defeating Hamas militarily is nil. Making it quite clear that this strategy, what the Israelis are doing, is not going to achieve what they're seeking out to achieve. And yet for that strategy, Biden has accepted a tremendous amount of risk. The fourth um, 
point of potential escalation is a direct confrontation between the United States and Iran or Israel and Iran. Iran, of course, is a backer of many of these different groups. Uh, it is supporting the Syrian militias. It is supporting Hamas. It is supporting Hezbollah, of course, the Iraqi militias, as well as the Houthis. However, I think there's a degree of nuance that is missing in the current debate or narrative in the United States. There's two exaggerated narratives. One that essentially says that the Iranians are in complete control of these different groups. Whatever they do is because Iran approved it, encouraged it, and that these groups have no agency of their own. That's the Washington narrative. It is incorrect. There's also an Iranian narrative in which they deny any responsibility for what these groups are doing, saying that they have total control and that Iran is uh, essentially not involved in their decision making at all and as a result has complete plausible deniability. That is also an exaggeration and a false narrative. The truth is somewhere in between, but it varies from group to group. Iran's relationship with Hezbollah, for instance, is a very, very close one, militarily, politically, ideologically, religiously. Their relationship with Hamas is very, very different. Hamas comes out of the Egyptian Brotherhood, Muslim Brotherhood, a Sunni organization that has had a very, very negative relationship with Shia Iran for quite some time. In the 1980s, when Hamas was founded, they supported Saddam Hussein's invasion of Iran. Mm -hmm. um, its original founder, Sheikh Yassin, was extremely anti-Iranian. And the thaw in relations between Hamas and Iran ironically only occurred after the Israelis in 2004 assassinated Sheikh Yassin and a new leadership came in that had a different attitude towards the Iranian that was not as hostile and was open to some degree of collaboration. But even after that, it was a very uh, complex relationship because Hamas was on the side of the Syrian opposition in the Syrian civil war against Assad, whereas the Iranians were on the side of Assad and they had a significant fallout during this period that only started to get patched up after 2017. So it's, these are two incomparable relationships that Iran has with Hamas and Hezbollah. When it comes to the Houthis, it's even more of a distance between the two. This is a very, very independent organization that even publicly rebukes Iran, criticizes Iran and believes that the Iranians have been very meek in their response to Israeli assassinations of Iranian generals, for instance. In one interview about uh, 10 days ago, Someone asked the spokesperson for the Houthis uh, if they are just a proxy of Iran. And the response he gave, I thought was quite telling. He said, if that was the case, he said, I assure you, we would not be in open conflict with Israel right now. Hinting quite clearly that the Iranians are not favoring this much more aggressive and open confrontation with the Israelis and prefer a much more indirect, lower level, uh, conflict, one in which they believe, for instance, that the harassment of U.S. troops in the region will lead to uh, increased prospects for the U.S. leaving the region altogether militarily. But if you do it too much or you do it in such a manner that you actually kill Americans, that actually provides the United States with a pretext to intensify its military presence in the region. And as a result, the Iranians are favoring a completely different approach than what the Houthis and even some of the Iraqi militias are pursuing. These nuances, which are crucial, are often offer, overlooked in Washington with a much more simplistic one. Thankfully, the administration appears to have understood it. And as a result, did not go into an open confrontation with Iran after those three Americans were killed by an Iraqi militia. If it had, we would have had essentially a regional war taking place right now, which would be devastating. Uh, I don't think I have to go too much into explaining that. Let me um, end with a couple of words about what the administration is doing right now and what I think is one of the big, big miscalculations. About 10 or 12 uh, days into the conflict, President Biden said that part of the reason why Hamas did this attack on October 7th was because they were trying to prevent Biden from creating peace in the world, in the Middle East, and that he was very close to creating peace in the Middle East. And this is why 
Hamas chose this date to attack Israel. What he's referring to is that the Biden administration's top priority in the Middle East has been to expand on the Trump administration's policy in the Middle East, which was to try to create normalization between Israel and the Arab states of the region without the creation of a Palestinian state. As you know, the position of most Arab states has been that they signed on to the 2002 Beirut Declaration, that Saudi peace plan, in which they all committed to recognizing and making peace with Israel if Israel recognized and allowed the creation for a Palestinian state. So the leverage the Arab states had was that they would offer recognition of Israel if Israel offered recognition of the Palestinians. The Trump administration essentially signed on to the Netanyahu preference, which was, no, let's just normalize relations with the Arab states, create direct flights between Tel Aviv and Dubai and, uh, and Riyadh, and create an anti-Iranian military alliance, because the real threat in the region, in his assessment, is Iran and just shove the Palestinian issue under the rug because no one cares about it any longer. It is not important. Trump administration signed on to this and they did what is so-called the Arab, uh, the uh, Abram Accords with the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan, and Morocco. They did not manage to get the Saudis to sign on to it. And getting the Saudis to sign on to it, of course, would be the biggest prize, partly because of Saudi Arabia's geopolitical importance, but also because it was the Saudis that put forward a 2002 proposal uh, in which they said that they would recognize Israel in return for an Israeli recognition of a Palestinian state. To get them to deviate from it would pave the way for the rest of the region, the theory goes, to also then sign on to a peace agreement or a normalization agreement with the Israelis without the creation of a Palestinian state. In Biden's narrative, this would create peace, despite the fact that it completely ignored the Palestinian issue. In the narrative of others, it is actually a key cause for the Hamas attacks of October 7th. Because once it had become clear that 20 plus years of diplomatic engagement, the Palestinian recognition of Israel, um, uh, the PLO's rescinding of terrorism, etc., that all of that led to nothing for the Palestinians. It has not led to a state. There's less of a chance of a state now than there was 20 years ago. This is a complete failure for diplomacy to actually deliver anything to the Palestinians. And on top of that, to then get the American side to sign on to it and say, you know, that's actually fine. We don't need a Palestinian state. We just need direct flights between Tel Aviv and, and UAE. That's what accounts for peace. That, that at some point, unfortunately, would lead the Palestinians to go back to violence. How would it would happen, when it would happen, no one could have predicted. But it was quite clear that that was a very likely outcome of a very, very foolish approach to this region. And unfortunately, it came on October 7th in, in a way probably much, much bloodier than many of the, us who predicted that this would happen had expected. Unfortunately, the Biden administration's conclusion of all that has happened in the last 100 plus days is that they simply had not moved fast enough, that they should go for it. And in fact, that the response, the solution to what is happening right now is not a Palestinian state, not actual peace, but making sure that there is an Israeli-Saudi uh, normalization. And that this is part of the reason why they refuse to put real pressure on Israel, even though Biden has the leverage to do so, because they were trying to keep the opportunity open for a normalization agreement. What is really concerning about this approach at this point, it's not just that they're trying to uh, create what they say a pathway to a Palestinian state. So I want to be very clear. What the Biden administration itself is saying is not even that there would be a Palestinian state, but there would be a pathway to a Palestinian state. So you would have this recognition on the Arab side of Israel, not in return for a recognition of a Palestinian state, but for a pathway that at some point in the distant future potentially could lead to a Palestinian state, all the while that the leaders of Israel themselves explicitly say that they will never permit 
a Palestinian state. Bibi has bragged that he is the one who has prevented a Palestinian state. And the Biden administration itself expressing in meetings with Arab Americans, as reported by the Washington Post um, or in the New York Times, no confidence at all that the Israeli government actually is serious about this, yet they're pushing for it. And on top of that, and I'll end with this, the Biden administration's effort goes far beyond what Trump did, because not only are they giving concessions to the Saudis, for instance, to go along with this, they're offering the mother of all concessions to the Saudis for this arrangement. They're offering the Saudis a security guarantee. And the one that they're discussing is on par with what the United States has with Japan and with South Korea, a treaty form security guarantee that would mean that Americans would have to send their sons and daughters to go and fight and die for the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the same kingdom that provided the seed money, both for Al Qaeda and ISIS. And this is their idea of resolving the current tensions. I mention all of this because I think at this point it should be very clear to us that the United States no longer has the credibility to lead any effort in the region to bring about an end to this conflict. The United States still has and should use its leverage to put pressure on Israel to seize its bombings. But any effort that is led by the United States for a longer term solution, I fear at this point, has zero credibility. And it is more time for us to recognize that we may need to step aside and allow the region or other actors to take the lead, not arguing for the US to be outside of the process, but arguing for the US to recognize we're not the solution. We're actually unfortunately part of the problem. Others need to step up. We need to make space for them to be able to step up to help resolve this conflict because we have become too embroiled, too biased to be able to pursue this in a manner that actually leads to a sustained peace. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Trita Parsi, for being with us today. Um, this is usually the moment where we have what we call musical message, uh, but we're going to go straight to the Q&A because Trita has, has limited time. Um, but what I will do, which I usually do at this moment, is uh, tell you that we rely on you to make this happen. and. Um, uh, there are several ways that, as any church does, we can collect, take the collection. Uh, but the best way for all of you uh, who are out um, in cyberspace is to go to our website, communitychurchofboston.org, and there is a credit card or a PayPal function there uh, for you to, to help us make this happen and to help us make this happen in a more effective, mm -hmm. elegant, and graceful way. Um, thank you again, uh, Trita, for, for joining us. Uh, before the q and I just want to show you uh, some images here. This is from a dear, uh, beloved friend of mine who is my nephew's girlfriend, my hopefully nephew-in-law, but I won't, say, I won't go there. Um, but um, these are beautiful pieces of art. That, mm -hmm. that she sent me and I have printed um, and maybe we'll make them banners eventually. I'm going to get close to the camera to show them to you uh, one at a time and then we'll go to the Q&A. Thank you, Ariel Diorio, for those images. Uh, she is a, uh, a art teacher in, in an elementary school and uh, does beautiful, um, gorgeous political work. For those of you who didn't see them here uh, in the audience. And this one. 
So I think uh, for our first um, question or comment, uh, Amar has asked to, to uh, address uh, Mr. Parsi. Go ahead, Amar. Great, thank you, Dean. And uh, thank you, Dr. Parsi, for that uh, really uh, important talk. Uh, my question is, I'm reading here, uh, it says you received your PhD under Francis uh, Fukuyama and Zygmunt Brzezinski. So I'm just wondering uh, what was that experience like and what is their uh, message or perspective on U.S. foreign policy and, and is their perspective shared by the U.S. Uh, foreign, uh, the U.S. policymakers of today? Thank you so much, Amar. Yes, yeah, so um, I, uh, I did my PhD at Johns Hopkins Science under uh, Frank Fukuyama, and Spik Brzezinski was on my committee as well. And uh, it, it was a tremendous uh, experience, uh, extremely valuable, um, and uh, taught me a tremendous amount. Of course, uh, I have, uh, you know, my own thoughts and views are not necessarily shared. Um, uh, but that's, I, I think, only speaks to their um, strong characters in terms of no one was trying to shape me in any particular way. Uh, it was a very honest uh, intellectual experience, and I, I, I deeply, deeply value it and respect that. Of course, Zbig is no longer with us. Zbig turned increasingly critical uh, towards Israel. Uh, and the U.S.'s relationship with Israel uh, over the years. I think he would have been extremely vocal today if he was still around. Uh, again, recognizing that we're taking tremendous amount of risks for things that are not of particular value to the United States. I think he would be very worried to see how the U.S. has become isolated on this issue uh, and what that does to U.S.'s standing globally. Uh, I've not followed what Frank is saying about this right now, so I can't speak to that. Um, but I think those would have been, um, as Big's voice would have been a, a very much needed voice today, mindful of the state of the debate that we have in the United States right now. And I, I'd say this in particular because of this. As you know, his daughter Mika and, and son-in-law is Morning Joe. And I think they have been some of the more hawkish voices um, on MSNBC in general on, on TV that has presented a rather one-sided perspective on this matter. They obviously tended to bring in Spain quite often on that show and, and he would have provided a much, much, uh, an extremely valuable counterweight. And I think he would have impacted their own thinking as well because of the tremendous respect they had for him. Here's a question from Jim right here. Uh, uh, I don't know how to address you. Uh, uh, doctor, professor? Trita is fine. All right, Trita, thank you. Uh, so I'm just a musician, and we know nothing. But um, uh, I appreciate that you framed things in terms of strategy. And I think the moral, the moral issue is very clear to most. Uh, and in terms of our feelings, it's a nightmare. Um, but the decisions are made at the top levels not based on feelings or morals, but based on strategy. Um, if the United States, by some miracle, the president, were able to stop all military and uh, economic funding to Israel, what effect do you think that would have on Israel? How would that change the situation? Um, and um, is, do you think that we're sim we continue to pay into it simply to maintain influence that obviously we don't have on a kind of hope or poor strategy, in my opinion. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that's a very, very important question. Um, and let me put it this way. The United States provides an unprecedented amount of weapons and ammunition to Israel right now. In fact, re relatively early in the war, the U.S. actually went in and got some ammunition they had sent to Ukraine and got it back to send it to Israel. The Israelis are expending ammunition at a completely unprecedented rate, to the point that if we stop providing it, 
they would run out in about five days and they would no longer be able to continue the bombing. They are using artificial intelligence to create um, targeting uh, goals for the Air Force because one of the things that delayed and didn't make it possible for them to uh, bomb at this rate was not that the planes were not ready, it was that the targeting was taking too long. So they're using AI to do so. And as a part of the variables that they've changed, and this is part of the reason why you have so many civilian deaths, is that they've targeted very, very, very low level, completely insignificant Hamas officials. Uh, so they have their database. They identify that someone who is, you know, of, of no significance in Hamas, nevertheless, is a target. He lives it with his family in this specific apartment building. And then they'll take down the entire apartment building with all of the other civilians that have nothing to do with Hamas at all. By changing those rules and using AI, they've been able to identify targets very quickly and bomb at an unprecedented rate. And they simply would run out of ammunition if we stop providing it. This is part of the reason I believe that twice Biden went around Congress to just be able to get this stuff faster to the Israelis. If we didn't, they would run out. And let me, you know, because what you're talking about goes to the point of does the United States have leverage? Of course it has leverage. And we have plenty of examples of history in which when American presidents have decided to use that leverage, it has been extremely impactful. In 1982, the, Lebanese, the Israelis went into Lebanon. American news back then actually showed what happened, un, un, uh, unlike what they're doing today. And the American public was um, aghast, did not like it at all. And this was affecting Ronald Reagan himself. He calls up Menachem Begin and essentially tells him, I'm not going to deliver you the F-16s unless you pull out. Begin, of course, was not happy, but he calls back after 20 minutes and tells Reagan that he's ordered a retreat from Lebanon. Very clear use of leverage precisely because we have these uh, deliveries of weapons. In 1991, when the United States was pushing Saddam out of Kuwait together with an Arab coalition, Saddam tried to break that coalition by firing Scud missiles into Israel, hoping that the Israelis would respond and once the Israelis were in the war, the U.S.-Arab coalition would fall apart because the Arabs could stomach fighting another Arab country alongside the United States. They could not stomach doing so alongside Israel. And Saddam understood this and he was trying to lure Israel into the war. The U.S. put a lot of pressure on the Israelis not to respond to about 34 Scud missiles that were fought, uh, uh, sent into Israel. And one way of doing so was to deny the Israelis uh, a specific code that airplanes use to be able to identify whether they're a friend or a foe. By not having those codes, by deliberately not delivering those codes, essentially the United States told Israel, if you fly your airplanes into Iraq, we will shoot you down. And guess what? Despite tremendous difficulties politically for the Israeli leaders, they didn't enter the war because we put that pressure. In the 2010s, when Israel was repeatedly threatening to bomb Iran, knowing very well that it would lead to a regional war and the US would get dragged into that war. And the US was in no mood whatsoever under Obama to go to war with Iran. I mean, he, Obama partly got elected because he was gonna end stupid wars. Um, Obama went public on CNN and said that he strongly opposes Israel taking such an action. This ended up having an impact on two occasions in the Israeli cabinet when they were seriously um, uh, debating whether to attack Iran or not. I mean, we're talking to the point in which the, uh, uh, the planes were on the tarmac ready to go as the cabinet was going to make a final decision. And a winning argument in the cabinet meeting was, if we do this, we're going to have a major, major crisis in the most important relationship we have, which is that between the United States and Israel. 
So Obama simply having stated this as a red line for the US had a profound impact on Israel's calculations. Biden has done the opposite. He's gone out of his way not to say anything publicly that is critical. And whatever he's saying privately, which we're told a lot is being said privately that is critical, we cannot see any evidence that it has had, had any impact. And we're at this moment, uh, we're seeing how the Israelis have now pushed 2 million Gazans into Rafah. And now they're saying that they're going to go militarily into Rafah. And it's going to be a complete bloodbath. The Europeans are against this. Biden is against it. Where is the pressure? Just being able to say that you're against it is meaningless unless you're willing to back it up with some real leverage. And this goes then to the core of your question. Are we doing this because we don't have the leverage? Or are we doing it because we want them to do so or, or other reasons? And I would say this. It's not that we don't have the leverage. It's the fact that the president calculates that there's a domestic political cost for him to use that leverage. And that's been the case for all presidents. To the extent that they can, they avoid putting pressure on Israel because of what they believe or perceive to be a domestic political cost associated with that. No one has gone as far as Biden has in choosing to avoid using it despite the massive risks that he's accepting. And as I mentioned in my talk, the risk of escalation in the region, the risk of him losing his election and according to him losing American democracy. So the reluctance to use it out of fear of a political cost, I think is what is to a very large extent driving this. And it's a miscalculation incidentally, because I think the White House completely miscalculated what the political cost is of not using the leverage. And we're seeing that in the polls, not just in key battleground states, not just in specific demographics, but throughout the entire country. Right now, Biden is losing to Trump in all seven battleground states. And his conduct in Israel, Gaza is a key factor there. Okay, next we have a question from Charlie. Hi, I, I'd like uh, to, you to talk a little bit about uh, relations between Iran and China and specifically um, how well is Iran plugged into the Belt and Road, Road Initiative? Thank you. Uh, the Iranian-Chinese relationship has grown quite significantly over the course of the last 10 plus years to a very large extent because of the fact that the opportunity for Iran to actually build relations with the West has, that door has been shut closed, particularly after Trump went out of the JCPOA and Biden messed up a return to the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal. The nuclear deal was not just to prevent the Iranians having a pathway towards a nuclear weapon. It was also to actually create a pathway for Iran to be able to rebuild relations with the West, get out of its isolation. It ended the containment policy. It only lasted about two years because Trump came in and even before he pulled out, he reinstated um, in violation of that agreement, much of the containment policies. This has now led to a situation in which Iran essentially doesn't have any other choices but to gravitate towards China and towards um, Russia. And it's interesting, when you look back in the debate in the United States in 1995-94, when the US under Clinton first started to impose real significant sanctions on Iran, and this was done out of, because of pressure from the Israelis at the time, it's quite fascinating because the debate in the United States you saw a key argument against this being, if we go down the path of just ending all bilateral trade with Iran, completely seeking to contain it, Iran will gravitate into the orbits of China and Russia. 30 years later, we see clear evidence that that argument was absolutely correct. And it's happened partially at least against the wishes of the Iranians in which at least a key element of the Iranian regime as much as they can be very critical of the United States nevertheless did not want to shut themselves out of uh, the West entirely. In terms of the Belt and Road Initiative Iran is plugged into it of course but because of the continued US sanctions uh, it is not receiving at all the same amount of investments from China uh, as 
many other countries that are part of the initiative do. So even when the Iranians are not trading with the US, and even as their trade with China is ended up becoming one of the key trades that they have, it is still very limited because of the US sanctions in which many Chinese companies simply do not want to risk losing access to the American market as a result of their involvement in the Iranian market. So it's still a major economic problem for them. One last point in terms of Iran and Russia. If the US had not pulled out of the JCPOA under Trump, and if Biden actually had had a much more clever strategy towards getting back into the deal, I don't think it's entirely his fault, but there were some very significant mistakes the Biden administration committed early in its presidency that have been the most decisive in terms of messing up a return to the JCPOA. Essentially, if there was a JCPOA today with the US in it, I am personally convinced, and I know many people in the US government are convinced, Iran would not be supporting Russia in Ukraine today. And that's one of the costs of uh, the policy of containing and completely isolating Iran. Okay. Next, we have a question from Sylvia Manning. Yes, my question um, has to do with when Israel says they, they're going to do whatever, however long it takes to eliminate Hamas, uh, isn't it true that there's a whole, that, that Hamas has a political only wing and that they are not at all militant and that they were actually on ballots and elected representatives? And so the, is that Israel's way of saying um, they're going to kill the population? They're not just talking about militant. Could you speak to that? Thank you. Um, of course, Hamas has a political wing, but it definitely has a military wing as well. Uh, the political wing is outside of the country and it's not entirely clear the influence they have, the, the extent to which they call the shots. Uh, and, and if they even, according to themselves, they were not even informed of uh, the plans for the October 7th attack. I think what the Israelis are saying in terms of there are no civilians in uh, Gaza, statements of that kind, I think do much more in terms of justifying from their standpoint, their military strategy, in which they're essentially dismissing the massive, massive civilian toll, because they're essentially saying that there is no such thing as real civilians. And they're pointing to the fact that uh, Hamas came to power um, through elections in 2006. There's some question marks about some aspects of that, but I think it's very important to keep in mind. That's 18 years ago. There's not been elections in Gaza since then. Hamas' impopularity in Gaza has been extensive. It's grown since October 7th, which is um, uh, you know, an implication of not only their attack, but the Israeli response to the attack. Hamas has also been very repressive and prevented political alternatives to emerge in the Gaza Strip. That has not necessarily been to uh, uh, the disfavor of the Israelis. I mean, there's a heated debate going on in Israel right now, pointing out that Netanyahu has preferred Hamas to survive, to be there, because from his standpoint, not wanting to have a Palestinian state, Hamas is preferable to the PLO or the PA, who explicitly favors a two-state solution. He much rather have these rejectionists that he can point to and then justify his completely uncompromising policies than to have a Palestinian alternative that actually does favor and is seeking a two-state solution. I think it's also important to keep in mind that Netanyahu knows very well that the minute this war ends, so does his political career. That the only reason he's in power right now is because the Israeli public doesn't have the stomach to have new elections in the midst of the war, although that may change if this goes on for a couple of more weeks and months. So he has an interest in prolonging this as a way of winning time and figuring out a way to save his career. And it's not just his career. 
once he no longer is prime minister, he's not going to be spending his civilian life most likely on some beach in northern Israel. Most likely he will spend it in jail because of corruption charges. So his way of fighting corruption charges is to be in office. Incidentally, I'm sure you can think of other parallels to that scenario in our own country right now. Hi. Um, I, I have two questions. One's quick. Um, did you say earlier on that Israelis have left the settlements and moved out for now out of the West Bank? And the second question is a group of us have been uh, talking about a two-state solution and a one-state solution and, and not having very much background at all. This mm -hmm. is a hypothetical question. If, if there was going to be recognition of Palestine, could there be a two-state solution given the geography that seems to exist? And secondly, if there were a one-state solution, doesn't that now m mean that Palestine is participating in the government of that one state. Thank you so much. Not sure I fully understood the latter part of the second question, but let me let me give it a shot. First, on your quicker question, uh, you have not in the West Bank, but in the Golan Heights, the northern part uh, of Israel, and parts that are disputed, of course, because. Uh, internationally recognized they belong to Syria, although the Trump administration changed the U.S.'s position on this as part of the um, um, uh, Abram Accords. Uh, those settlements have largely been depopulated because their proximity to the Lebanese border. It's not the case for elsewhere uh, uh, in the West Bank, but when we're talking about the Golan Heights, that is the case. In terms of the two-state solution and the one-state solution, um, let me put it this way. This is not my area of expertise, but there is a growing frustration that the talk of two-state solution has ended up becoming a pretext for doing nothing. In the sense that there's a lot of talk, a lot of pathways to a Palestinian state, but they never lead anywhere. And that it's ended up becoming an instrument for a status quo. A status quo in which Israel uh, expanded its settlements, made a Palestinian, a viable Palestinian state more and more difficult, but the illusion, the promise of a two-state solution mm -hmm. essentially mm -hmm. enabled um, Western governments to uh, essentially say that they're doing something, whereas in reality they were in effect preventing the Palestinians from being able to um, achieve their national aspiration. Whether a one state or other type of solutions are um, a possibility, uh, I cannot speak of right now. Um, I, I have a hard time envisioning exactly the pathway to them. But there appears to be a growing body who believe that there has to be a conversation about achieving Palestinian statehood that is not tied to the Oslo process, the peace process led by the United States, that other pathways need to be found and, uh, and thought about it because we simply have too long of experience of seeing that this does not work, that the US's approach to this has essentially been to put its weight entirely behind the Israelis, knowing quite well, knowing very, very well that the Israeli game plan all along has been to expand settlements, in a strategic manner to make the realization of a Palestinian state an increasingly unlikely outcome. And we have gone along with it. And that's, I think, frankly, is part of what Obama himself was referring to when he was giving comments about this a couple of weeks uh, into the conflict in which he said, we all have to look at ourselves and recognize that we have all contributed to this problem. I think this is what he was referring to, a very clear knowledge on the American side of what the Israelis were doing, but under the guise of pretending that there still was a peace process and a two-state solution in the making, we essentially turned a blind eye, if not actively even enabling the Israelis. Okay, I 
think we have time for one, maybe two more questions. So next we'll go to Lenny, who's a board member of the community church. Go ahead, Lenny. Uh, Lenny, you're muted. Can you unmute? Okay, can you hear me now? Uh, kind of. It's very soft. How about now? Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. Uh, when this conflict began, there were two stories that I just wanted to know if you heard of. One was uh, that the junior border guards around Gaza, you know, saw something going on and they reported this to the higher ups in the IDF and they were ignored for hours. The IDF just ignored them. The other story is that these, there were, uh, stock market kind of uh, strange things going on in the Israeli stock market where certain stocks went way up right before October 7th. And uh, have you heard anything about those stories? Thank you. On, on the second one, I have not. On the first one, there were uh, reports by intelligence officers in Israel uh, observing what they believed was the preparation for some sort of an attack or invasion by Hamas, that these warnings were sent up but were dismissed by higher ups. And at some point, there will likely be some form of an investigation on the Israeli side that seeks to get to the bottom of this, as there was after the 2006 Lebanese Israeli war. Mm -hmm. But at this point, um, you, you're not seeing anything else done except for by uh, journalists that are digging into it. Uh, because the, there is already a very active blame game, but it's happening under the shadows of a continued war. But I think it will reach the conclusion that this was a massive intelligence failure on all different levels. It is not just uh, the, uh, the fault of Netanyahu per se, but also um, uh, throughout the intelligence community. But the bigger error, in my view, is one that they will not reach, uh, address, which is the intelligence, the political, the diplomatic, and perhaps most importantly, the moral failure of thinking that they actually could oversee an indefinite occupation of another people without it leading to violence, without leading to death and destruction on both sides. That is the biggest failure of imagination and immorality and strategic thinking on the Israeli side. And I fear that they are nowhere near the the distance from this conflict, the self-reflection necessary to even approach addressing that issue. Okay, uh, next up we have a question from Reva. Reva, can you please unmute? Uh, you're muted. Can you? Okay. Um, I'm Leila Hijab Cable, and uh, um, a couple of things people keep putting in the chat about the military industrial complex, and you shouldn't ignore that because senators will vote for the economic benefits. And the US, for decades, have invested mostly in military equipment. And my brother was doing a PhD in California, and he said his project about high speed trains was pushed aside for the sake of a military one. That's one thing, and I think we can't ignore it. And there are movements here that are against that, and we should work with them. And I get a lot of their mailings. The one thing I want to say is about the one state. Is 30 years ago, God, that's so long ago. My daughter was, my youngest was 10 or under. We had a conference at MIT, and it was one of many called One State. Because Oslo was not, Madrid and Oslo were not going to bring any benefit to Palestinians. Uh, this uh, convoluted agreement, which as a daughter of a jurist, an international jurist, I recognized immediately, although I had no degree in law, that this was not a legal document and um, had no plans, had no maps, had uh, steps of talking. One state, I think, is going to be in, in the long run, whether it becomes like a binational or totally one state, it's not gonna be easy because the Zionists are not gonna give up privilege, unfortunately. 
And they have to be done from outside. People have to stop giving them money and weapons. And so far now, we don't have it. At 44 years of speaking and working for Palestine, I realized this has all been nonsense. We need to work on uh, changes in our system that is corrupt. It's a system of money. It's a system of war. Uh, it's a system that sides with oppressive, with autocratic systems. It's, it didn't come out of the blue that they support Israel. They support every um, autocratic dictator, a murderer around the globe, from attacking Cuba and the Philippines in the 19th century to um, Central America, to Chile, uh, to Libya early on, long before that. So basically... We have to change the thinking in the U.S. And I don't know, I think the young people need to work on that because most of us are in our 70s and 80s and are our way out. And we need to get young people to really kind of say, we need to change this corrupt system. It's not just Israel, it's a corrupt U.S. system. And if you watch two movies, one is called uh, War is Not Good for Children or Any Living Beings. Um, and it's done by the American Friends Service Committee about US wars for 150 years. The US has had wars for 150 years. This country needs to change a path and say peace for everybody, not just for chosen groups of people that they pick because they suit them. Um, the other one was done by Juan Gonzalez from Democracy Now! And it's about why we have immigrants, so many immigrants at the doors of the US. And it's because of US wars. In Central America, and he touched briefly on Iraq, Afghanistan, and Palestine. So I think we need to push for a movement that says we need to make changes to this corrupt system of governance that relies on dark money, relies on military equipment, relies on people not really being informed, a media that's totally corrupt. Um, the young people are aware because they're on the web. But most people my age, I worked in schools. Most teachers kind of ignored me. As a matter of fact, I was at a union conference the other day and I mentioned something about raising money for Palestine. I said, I'm selling some artifacts in my house because I gave as much as I can. And these women, minority women, turned away and started talking about something else. And I said, I worked 23 years in a school system where people ignored my personality as a Palestinian. And it's because people are ignorant in general about history and geography, but also the media. Gives Leila, can we ask you to, uh, we, Trita only has like three or four. Yeah, well, anyway, minutes. that's I'm Please. wrapping up. Thanks. We need to have a movement that is Please. not just talking. I've talked for 44 years, demonstrated. It's not enough. We need to do something, withhold money, our taxes, whatever we do to make changes. Thank you. Um, sorry, I don't know if you want me to comment. I, I can only agree with you, particularly when it comes to the military industrial complex, the, the profits they are making out of this war and the pressure they're putting uh, should not in any way, shape or form be belittled. Um, I think it's important at the same time to recognize that when the American public is mobilized against the military industrial conflict, and it's not a lot of examples we have because our public is so distracted from all kinds of other things. But when they are, uh, we see that the public absolutely has a, an ability to uh, uh, veto what they want. Take a look at, for instance, the time when the Obama administration went to Congress in regards to a military intervention in Syria. And people had the time to mobilize and they knew that there was a specific decision point and it was not over a long period of time it was time limited the american public overwhelmingly beat back some of the strongest lobbies in the united states the administration itself as well as the military industrial conflict as well as other countries lobbying for it uh, and, and there wasn't the fight in congress was completely one-sided the public overwhelmingly won but it's not oftentimes we have those moments in which it is so clear, the decision is so succinct, the time is succinct, and people understand that if they really get engaged right now, they can have an impact. But when they do, they're overwhelmingly powerful, uh, much more so than the military industrial complex.
Dr. Trita Parsi, thank you so much for your brilliant, incisive uh, address this morning. Uh, we are so grateful and we hope that we can receive you in person here at Community Church um, at some future date. Uh, that would be a, really a pleasure for us to, um, to receive you and host you here. Um, it would be my pleasure. Thank you. And on that note, I just need to tell folks about March 15th, which is Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson will be here in person um, to to speak on a Friday night. And um, I hope you will join us for that, both in person as well as virtual. And again, thank you so much for being with us. And now we get to end this this beautiful morning before we uh, go to lunch, which Luis Guzman, our cook and uh, custodian has prepared for us with uh, a nice little dose of, of Jim Infantino. Um, the, it's, it's the perfect icing on the, on the cake, if you will. Um, uh, Jim, thank you so much for being with us. And Trita, again, thank you. And um, whatever, whatever you like, Jim, maybe two or three songs or something would, sure. do, would, would do us just, just beautiful as a, an appetizer for lunch. And, uh, and thanks again for all of you in person for joining us. Um, and uh, free Palestine. And one democratic state. That's that's it's got to happen. There's there's no other way. Say I, in my very humble, tiny opinion. Everybody feels that they are special. Everybody knows that they will come. Everybody thinks they'll find their fortune when we know it's only some. Everyone believes in a beauty. Only they can see, and that's how I know that everybody is just like me. So have a little compassion, have a little bit of empathy, have a little of what you're looking for. Have a little compassion, have a little humility, have a little compassion. Have a little more. Nobody wants to keep on getting older. Nobody wants to die alone. Nobody wants to have their true, find their true love just in time to let them go. Nobody wants to keep on striving when there's nothing they can do. And that's how you know that nobody is not like you. So have a little compassion. Have a little bit of empathy, have a little of what you were looking for, have a little compassion, have a little humility, have a little compassion, have a little more. People just want things for themselves But the real treasures in this world What you give to someone else So have a little compassion Have a little compassion Have a little compassion Have a little more Have a little compassion have a little compassion, have a little compassion, have a little more, have a little compassion, have a little bit of empathy, have a little bit of what you're looking for, have a little compassion, have a little humility, have a little compassion. Have a little more, have a little compassion, have a little more. Thank you. It's a, it's a privilege uh, playing for you all. Thank you. Something's happened to my voice, so I'm, gonna, I'm working around it. But, um, uh, I, 
thanks. I've been drinking coffee, I think, that really strong coffee you make, Dean. And it has paralyzed my vocal cords, but uh, woken me up. Uh, hopefully I can, I can play you this song. I think this is one you know. Um, I wrote this uh, at a folk festival in which I, I felt like there weren't any folk songs being played. I thought I was listening to pop and country songs. And uh, I, then it made me wonder, what is a folk song? A song sung by folks. Uh, what is that? And so I ended up, I found myself rewriting this old, this old tune. And I know Dean has put this on his record. And uh, I'm, I'm very, I'm very uh, honored by that. Thank you. And it is also a standard anthem for this church. We sing it here, here all the time. Well, I must and play it then. for like 10 years. Thank you. Oh, cool. That's about when I wrote it. Maybe a little longer. <clears throat> See if I can sing it. Uh. Rise up, you lonely wanderers. Rise up, you hungry people. Hurricane is coming. Land will soon be flooded. Past is dead and over. Rise up now, claim your freedom. You are the sleeping. Rise, rise, rise Do not beg for your salvation Preachers, kings, and masters People hold the power Rise and claim your freedom Wealthy and joy privacy Our services only Hide your acquiescence Only while you stay in darkness Rise, rise, rise Thank you for um, thank you for having me here. This is a tune uh, kind of haunts me. Uh, 
kind of weird to write a song that then ends up haunting you. We are not who we were, so I feel like I cover my own song sometimes. I had a dream, but then my dream became my day job. And now I cannot find a friend to listen to me complain. I had a scheme, but then my scheme became a nightmare. I gotta find a scheme to fix it. Sail away to Utopia, Utopia, further and further on the edge of the horizon. Utopia, Utopia, pack your bag, we're trekking to Utopia. So I became a leader But something has gone a lot and I, I didn't see it coming If I had a song, well then I could make it sweeter Standing in the public square looking forward to what he's going to come up with next. Um, uh, I was hoping that J uh, Jim's daughters, he has one 10 and one 12, would, would come because it so happens that, um, that they live near here in the, in the South End. And uh, so uh, we'll do that next time, uh, I hope, uh, because I have a song I, I want to sing for them. I won't sing it for you now, but, uh, but when they come, uh, we'll... We'll share that song with them. Uh, I, I have a friend named Bob Blue, passed away 15 years ago, and I do a bunch of his songs, which are sort of kids' songs, um, but that, that deal with uh, um, grown-up topics. Um, just, just wonderful songwriter, Bob Blue, rest in peace. Uh, oh, great songs. So we come to the end here. Um, uh, I want to thank Trita Parsi again for being with us, and, and Jim, your songs. 
Incredible. Um, I can't leave without mentioning what happened here in this same room last night. We had a peña, which is what we call our once a month uh, event, which is a Latin American style uh, open mic. And it, it is, is brought to us by Encuentro Cinco, which uh, three um, of our officers were very active in Encuentro Cinco, which used to be a space which closed and is now sort of folded within us. And um, we have both their junk <laughs> as well as their human resources, which are an incredible treasure. Um, our president, Sandra Reese Harris, and our um, our um, Vice President Alan Perez and, and also Jose Aleman, um, that's Encuentro Cinco. And we had a really beautiful international event here last night. There were uh, people from a whole bunch of different countries, including Latin America, but also Morocco and, uh, and Portugal and, um, and a couple of Middle Eastern people as well and a Sp Spaniard couple. Uh, it was beautiful. It's just, just really bringing to us a really incredible international um, flavor to what we do here. So I, I uh, encourage you all to to come to the Peña. Uh, the next one is in March. It's always the second Saturday. And also encourage you to come to the monthly um, John F. Kennedy uh, speech address. Uh, this, uh, uh, this month, as I said before, is Dr. Helen Caldicott, introduced by Martin Sheen. Next month, I am I right, is Dennis Kucinich? April, April. oops, April. Uh, we don't have March yet, or, or maybe we do, it doesn't matter. Just uh, keep your eye out uh, and, and open. If you haven't um, uh, joined our mailing list, you can send us an email address or you can, um, you can sign up in person right here. There's a clipboard in the back. And um, uh, I, think, I think I'm done. I have no, nothing else to say. This has been a, a really beautiful morning. Trita Parsi's incredible. And I hope, as he said, it, it would be my privilege we can um, host him um, in person sometime when he's in Boston. Uh, that would be a beautiful thing. Folks, we'll see you next week. Make progress, do good work, and keep in touch. Meeting at the building is over. <laughs>